Um, <laughs> okay, then. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the first faculty works in progress of the spring semester 2024. Um, Happy New Year to you all. Um, I know, I think almost all of you here. I'm Lori Lefkowitz. Um, the faculty works in progress is a a collaborative project of the Dean's Office in the College of Social Science and Humanities and the Humanities Center. Um, the goal of the Faculty Works in Progress is for us to learn from one another, to build intellectual community by um, hearing one another's work, to benefit from uh, interdisciplinary um, collaborations and interdisciplinary feedback to our research. Um, so, as I said, I'm Lori Lefkowitz. As you know, I am the former and, for the moment, uh, briefly, the interim director of the Humanities Center. And um, it's very hard for me to say those words. So I just want to acknowledge that I am briefly in this role because of the personal and communal um, tragic loss that we all suffered on December 5th with the death of our really much-loved colleague and friend, Angel David Nieves. Um, whose many important roles included directing the Humanities Center. And of course, um, like many of you, I see him in my mind's eye standing at that podium, giving one of his inimitable introductions, framing everything exactly perfectly and honoring the work of our colleagues by really situating the importance of their work. So um, I just, uh, uh, want to acknowledge before we proceed with today's business, um, just that there is collective sorrow in this room that I know we will carry for a long time. And um, yeah, so um, I um, am very, very excited to hear from our colleague today. Uh, Nicole is a new, a new faculty member, um, but on the Mills campus in the English department, which is also my department. So it's my honor and privilege to introduce um, Professor Theo Davis, who is our chair and who will introduce our colleague, Nicole. Thanks. Um, Thank you, Lori, um, and thanks to all of you for coming out on this freezing cold day that might remind us of the downsides of Boston versus Oakland. Um, <laughs> maybe that's appropriate um, since this is a nice chance for a CSSH works in progress that connects our two campuses uh, together. So uh, Nicole M. Guadani Hernandez, she started her career in gender studies at the University of Arizona and was the inaugural chair of the Department of Mexican American and Latino Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. She was the founding director of the Mellon Mage program at UT. During her tenure as the inaugural executive director of the Mills Institute, she worked closely with the alumni and was instrumental in creating a strategic plan and research and graduate certificates that focused on gender and racial justice, DEI, and disability advocacy. As a professor of English at Northeastern, she directs the Dialogues and Civilizations course, Mexico City, Gender and Migration, starting summer 2024, and she continues her work co-editing the award-winning book series, Latinx, The Future is Now, with UT Press, and also a second series with the University of Nebraska Press. She has served on Ms. Magazine's editorial board for 20 years, and she provides media expertise on Latinx and feminist issues with regularity. She's the author of numerous articles and two award-winning books, Unspeakable Violence, Remapping U.S. and Mexican National Imaginaries, and Archiving Mexican Masculinities in Diaspora in 2021. Today's lecture uh, is a work in progress from her manuscript, Intimate Partner Violence in the Latinx World, 1880 to 1917 which is forthcoming from the T Press in 2025. Uh, please join me in welcoming her. I, I was I was saying you are now truly in CSSH and you're in RP 909. Oh. <laughs> awesome to CSSH and to uh, especially our 
the um, lovely introduction, um, Theo, and I just want to acknowledge that we're on Wampanoag and uh, Poconoag, as well as um, Mashpee lands. I think we can't forget who was here before us and, and remind of that. And, you know, I was a very good friend of David's when we were in graduate school. There is a 20 year period when we did a talk um, and I was sad to hear of his passing. So I, you know, you all know him as Ankel. I knew him as David. And so anyway, I just want to acknowledge him. So uh, this book, uh, this is a chapter from this book and Cuban is in quotes because as you'll see, uh, there's a question about this. So um, come on, let me do this. I have to bring it this way, oops. Ah. All right, so on March 7th, 1914, the New York Times, just a few years after the US intervention in Cuba ended, it reported that Mrs. Mabel Garcia, a young Cuban widow with five small children was murdered by Victor Reynaldo, who committed suicide shortly thereafter. During the early 1900s, the Times regularly published an index of suicides taking place in major cities around the U.S. And from January to March of 1914, Ronaldo's suicide and Garcia's murder appeared with 58 other cases in New York City alone. So I'm talking about this as a cultural phenomenon. Ronaldo, quote, was also said to be Cuban, end quote, and had attacked her in her third floor flat at 1355 Park Avenue in what is now East Harlem. So I'm gonna show you a map. Oops, forgot it's that way. Oops, what happened here? Right. It's, it's like a little too, sensitive. It's sensitive, it's yeah. very sensitive. I am not a sensitive person. So. <laughs> um, anyway, so this is contemporary, this is the building where it happened and in contemporary Manhattan and you can see the, you can see the uh, little map there. So Ronaldo, uh, had been a manager at the small cigar factory owned by Mrs. Garcia's late husband, George. Other accounts say that the Garcia factory was large and that Mabel Garcia was, quote, a rich Cuban widow. The factory, located at 76 Broad Street, was uh, left to Mrs. Garcia by her husband, George Garcia. It was a prime piece of real estate, only a few blocks from the New York Stock Exchange and Bowling Green, New York City's oldest public park. The factory was adjacent to the main dealer of Cuba's fame, Romeo y Julieta cigar label. And in the 1910 census, the Garcias had been married for seven years. She was 30 years of, 33 years of age, and her husband was 38. At that point, the couple had four children, Jody, aged 10 months, uh, Mianmez, aged two, Million, which was aged three, and Ruthie, aged five. So I provide all of this context to situate us in this uh, Latinx world, right? So Mr. Garcia dies, and within one short year after his death, Mr. Ronaldo begins approaching Mrs. Garcia. This is what all the accounts said, the police reports, the grand jury, all, all of those investigations. According to the Evening World, Mr. Reynolds, which if you do Black or Latinx history, you know they ruin our names all the time, mm -hmm. Mr. Reynolds was, quote, a persistent suitor and called at the Garcia home regularly, end quote. And so that's why I use this IPV framework, because even if she wasn't in a relationship with him, he thought they were in a relationship, which now, you know, we would call that stalking. <laughs> so anyway, because uh, Reynolds or Ronaldo was a young man well known to the tenants of the house as an employee of Mrs. Garcia's cigar factory, his presence was not questioned on the day that he entered the building on the morning of March. Oh, there's, oh, okay. Of March uh, 4th, 1914. Ronaldo had timed his entrance to the Garcia home immediately after her brother in law, Robert Burnett, who had been guarding the house, left. So he's guarding it, which means he knows that Ronaldo is out there. Right. Her eldest daughter, Ruth, did not know who admitted Ronaldo to the flat, but, quote, he stepped into the dining room without a word like he belonged there, end quote. According to her sister, Julia Burnett, quote, Reynolds had put money into the cigar business and had been its manager, but Mrs. Garcia bought out his interest three weeks ago because of his persistent attentions 
to her, unquote. Another one of those 19th century code words for stalking, right? The Brooklyn Daily Eagle had noted that, quote, he had been discharged because of his insulting advances to the widow, end quote, probably putting his hands on her and stalking, right? So Mrs. Garcia essentially dismissed Ronaldo uh, for his impropriety, demonstrating her ability to control her business and her personal life, as well as her finances. She had the liquid assets to take sole ownership of the business, and Ronaldo clearly needed the relationship with her and or the money. Otherwise, why would you sell your interest to a company? Like many women, widows in mourning in the hemispheric Americas, uh, refusing the advances of another man reflect her propriety uh, after her husband's death and prove a firm belief in the cultural values attached to being a proper and property widow of this cigar merchant class, mostly dominated by Cubans and Puerto Ricans. Um, the ordering of Garcia's family's domestic life and economic assets after George Garcia died, I think opened up a windfall of conflicts and gender contestations around economics and autonomy between Mrs. Mabel Garcia and Ronaldo. So these are the headlines, right? Which is, um, you know, shoots widow dead and slays himself. And I should note that this is the period of yellow journalism and um, kind of hyperbole as public practice. And so this was one of those sensationalized stories, you know, that uh, was supposed to wreak feeling and havoc on the bodies of the consumers, as well as I think to scare people in some ways about um, Latinx immigrants, right, broadly defined in New York when they're coming in mass. And so this is just an advertisement of the, the Romeo and Julieta label, which was right next door to um, the Garcia's factory. And the Garcia's factory is really small and compared to the huge transnational enterprise of Romeo and Julieta for the moment. So I wanna switch to the kids. This is slide four. Yes, okay, just wanna make sure. Um, because they're there when their mother is murdered. And I think that class, okay, I just need to like stop with this. All right, so, um, right, the four children are there. And for me, it takes on these details of the murder-suicide about racial violence and intimate partner violence. According to some sources, Mr. Ronaldo apparently shouted several times to Mabel Garcia, marry me, to which she replied an emphatic no. Second, he was of a very dark skin complexion and was a West Indian, end quote. And so this is kind of up for grabs in terms of what West Indian means. Does it mean that he's Afro-Cuban? Does it mean that he's Trinidadian? Is it a reflection of racism to understand all blackness as West Indian and not think about the complexities of Afro-Latinx identity? My guess is that he's Cuban and I haven't found confirmation yet, but I'm trying to figure that out as part of this. So third, what I've learned is that Garcia was an Italian immigrant. She was actually not Cuban, but because she's married to a Cuban American, well, let me rephrase that, a Cuban born, uh, uh, wait, a Puerto Rican born Cuban of Spanish descent, let me get it right. Um, it's assumed that she is Cuban and or a Spaniard, right? So for me, this is like the quintessential Latinx studies question about race and naming and a moniker, right? And third, right, so Garcia is Italian and her husband who died about a year ago is Spaniard, right? But that's up for grabs as well. And quote, jealousy was said to have prompted the double crime, right? This double tragedy, jealous Cuban uh, kills himself and this woman. So he's West Indian, he's Cuban. He may be black, he's not black. She's Cuban, Latina, no wait, she's Italian, right? On our immigration records. So this is the, the milieu of what I'm calling the Latinx world, right? And so within this racial matrix, the black question or the consequences of crossbreeding, um, right, as a number of scholars have argued in both Black studies and Afro-Latinx studies, 
are implied in this description of Ronaldo as West Indian or black, as if Cuban, Cuba did not have a sizable black population at that historical moment that was migrating out and working in the cigar business in New York City, as well as Ybor City and Tampa, Florida. So Mabel Garcia is an Italian immigrant who married and had children with a Spaniard from Cuba born in Puerto Rico, right, could not have wed below her racial and class status, making Ronaldo's marriage proposal, right, all the more revolting. As they say, she, she repulsed him, right? The racial logic of this Italian American widow who's coded as Spanish, was to protect her children, their inheritance, and uphold her position as a business holding white adjacent immigrant with children of Spanish, Latin, or Latinx descent. Super complicated. What's interesting is that Mr. George Garcia's death enabled Ronaldo to believe that Mabel should be married to him instead of being the sole owner and operator of a cigar factory. Such a murder, uh, mur murder, excuse me, such a marriage, <laughs> maybe they're the same in this case, such a marriage would have provided Ronaldo class and racial mobility, especially if he was indeed an Afro-Cuban man. And what we see here is a uh, instance of anti-Black sentiment that was clearly an underlying text of this rejection. So when the murder happens, Ronaldo thrusts himself into her flat, kills his victim with a revolver, which from the press and the reports is taken as an implied instance of racial hostility and an improper emotional economic attachment. So there is this jealousy about Mabel Garcia's wealth that comes through in the documents and about her economic autonomy which gestures to this idea that an Afro-Cuban or uh, West Indian suitor, Ronaldo, acted with class climbing logic and racial climbing logic to justify his violent mode of dealing with Mrs. Garcia's rejection of his marriage and treaties. I talk in this book about violence as a mode of communication, and it's not to dismiss the heinousness or the criminality of these events, but rather to try and understand the logic of how folks are operating. So while this moment um, is an important one in the history of immigration in the United States, both for um, European immigrants and for Latinx people alike, it's also a period that Anne Twynham describes as a moment when mulatos and pardos could buy or essentially move what she calls gracias a sacar, an exemption that provided the privileges of whiteness. There is evidence of this kind of racial passing in Latinx communities happening and it's through wealth, right? Um, and so I would argue that in this moment, the ideology continues without the structure, at least in Ronaldo's actions. So this idea of purchasing whiteness via marriage is exemplified in Ronaldo's desperate pleas to marry Mrs. Garcia and also the desperation of selling his shares in the factory. So in this regard, my interpretation of a potential marriage is a transactional one, but it nonetheless emap, uh, maps both the emotional, right, jealousy, and economic violence as a response to rejection as coming to bear on Mabel Garcia's violent murder. So what happens, uh, as I mentioned, Ronaldo enters the flat, he um, makes three shots. And once he realizes that she's dead, he turns the pistol on himself and fell to the floor near her body. The five children were at the room in this time, which also means that she and George Garcia had another baby before he died in 1910. And the witnesses of the, the murder suicide of their mother and the children uh, were were traumatized by what happened to her. They witnessed the, the murder of their mother and the suicide of her slayer. And her sister arrived just as it was happening, Julia Brennan, and said, quote, it was terrible. <clears throat> so I wanna talk a little bit about how we might think of this moment, the violent murder and suicide of Ronaldo and Mabel Garcia's demise as a moment of intimate partner violence. Um, 
the framework emphasizes the criminal aspects of the murder. It reads for me as intimate partner violence because Ronaldo imagined a courtship and a financial relationship with Mrs. Garcia. It has the hallmarks of a misinterpreted object relation of property, right? Um, as I noted, the press and the court documents state numerous times that he was a spurned suitor, right? So if we take that relationship of matrimonial fantasy, it's racial delusions, right? Led to violence and revenge on his love object who happened to also be an object of capitalist desire, right? She is a symbolic re relationship to that cigar factory that he wants to own. So if he owns her, he can own the factory, right? So while the violence and confrontation of murdering a woman in front of her children is strategic, right? Asserting himself as a patriarchal figure, there is an absence of the discussion of racialized passion discourse in reporting the Garcia Renaldo confrontation, right? And so in lieu of that, the tone focuses our attention on Ronaldo's impropriety and desiring to social climb and Mary Garcia as a black West Indian and or Cuban versus a kind of unbridled love passion that is linked to negative racialization. And so Ken Pleck, the historian, would describe this moment as a kind of family violence, quote, where physical force is used with the aim of causing injury, end quote. And so I want to take this a step further and, you know, um, the risk of, of sounding uh, obnoxious. I see this, this work as picking up where Anne Pleck left off in domestic tyranny, but with a racial, gendered, feminist, women of color perspective to it. Um, so in this regard, what I think we learn from an IPV framework Right, and some folks could call me anachronistic from a historical perspective to use a contemporary language to talk about this, but I don't think this is not domestic violence, it's something else, right? So the discrepancy about gendered and racial relations for me, I think is really fleshed out with this IPV framing of this book and the larger case, right? That is, there is a deeply classed and racialized dimension that is that Ronaldo could only seek mobility from manager to full honor by marriage and not through work, right? And after being fired with Mrs. Garcia, there was no alternative to advance in the structure to own the means of production. And in this brutal moment of murder and suicide, we again see the hallmarks of this misinterpreted object relation of property. Right. There's this sense of entitlement, patriarchal cultural entitlement, to Mrs. Garcia, her assets and her family, right? which is why I think the, the murder-suicide takes place in the home. Right, It's his way of taking control over the domestic sphere because he can't have control of the means of productions, production in the cigar industry. So without possession of the woman and her business, right, aggressive and violent measures ensured that not even her children could have access to her in the way that Ronaldo cannot as well. So Ronaldo's murder of Mabel Garcia and his own suicide demonstrate a breakdown in economic, gendered, and racial structures. Because being a fired manager of a cigar factory surely translated into what he thought would be managing Mrs. Garcia's family, heart, and assets. So I wanna talk a little bit about the racial sort of gender dynamics in the aftermath of intimate partner violence by talking about the children. So because the children we're in the next room when they heard the shots. I also want to make an argument about how they robbed the Garcia children of their caretaker, their racial class in her inheritance, and their little literal inheritance of assets. Right? All of the documents discuss the kind of shock and horror of their mother's murder. And it is discursively reflective of beliefs espoused about unnaturally severe exposures of children to cruelty 
in the late 1800s. The children as witness is another marker of intimate partner violence, as feminist historians and scholars have taught us. And even if Mrs. Garcia was not in a romantic relationship with Mr. Ronaldo, the children were familiar with him. He had been in their home, which means he was a person of trust within their family, which is also a hallmark of intimate partner violence. So with these incidents of both him being familiar in the home, the rise of family violence in New York City since the 1870s, well documented by by um, historians. The horror of Mrs. Garcia's murder translates into a life of trauma for her children and their entrance into the social services system thereafter. So these Latinx children, a Spanish, Cuban, Puerto Rican, Italian immigrants, it's a mouthful, but that's who they are, right? In the aftermath of intimate partner violence of the murder-suicide, muddle the waters of whiteness, race, and social class that should have been accrued through the ownership of that cigar factory. So in tracing the lives of the Garcia children after their father died and their mother was murdered, all five children, and we can see it here in this blurry census record, right? all five of the children were placed with the Sisters of St. Joseph's Home, the Third Order of St. Francis in Peekskill, New York. She had a sister in New York City. She had another sister in Albany and they went into foster care, Catholic foster care. So during the mid 1800s, the Catholic church received a number of children throughout the country that no longer could be supported by family. So the question is, why didn't her family take them? And or why couldn't her family afford to take them? Or even his family, right? We don't know what happened to them. But nonetheless, in, in the Depart New York Department of Public Welfare, um, right, repeat, requested that the Fransc Franciscan missionary sisters and other orders like them accept orphans and property at this peak skill location on the banks of the Hudson River. And St. Joseph's particular took in destitute or orphan children ages two to 16. So instead of being taken in by their aunt, Mrs. Frank Burnett, Mabel's sister who witnessed the murder or her other sister Agnes in Albany, the children became wards of the state and were kept together as a family. And I should note that their names were actually not the names that I showed you earlier. These are their names as annotated by themselves on the census. Milton, not Milian. Emmanuel, and I forget what the other version is, but it's way off, right? Ruth, Dorothy, not Dodie, and Evelyn. So the other thing that it says is that the children, their native language is Spanish, which is the language of their father, not Italian, which also means that Mabel speaks, spoke Spanish, right? And that their second language is English, even though they learned it as a second language. And what is curious about this census data is that the children were identified as inmates. I've since learned that the foster care system always referred to children as inmates, which is in and of itself an act of discursive violence, right? But it's standard procedure. So when I first saw this data, I did a double take because I thought they were in prison, not knowing, and then I talked to some other colleagues. But in some ways they said, no, they're not in prison. That's just the standard protocol of the moment. But for me, it still evokes that, right? And I don't wanna lose sight of that. Um, but the census narrated their residence in the Catholic charity as home and not a relationship of captivity which as I said, I still find disturbing given the trauma and violence that the children witnessed and the incapacity of the home to sort of treat that trauma, right? Because they're wards. So this Garcia family story demonstrates the complexity of what became 19th century Latinx migrations and worlds. Contrary to these newspaper reports that Mrs. Garcia was Cuban and therefore so too was her deceased husband, suggests that Mabel, in fact, or actually show that Mabel, oh, sorry, I don't have that one. Okay, my apologies. Mabel was born in Italy in 1887 and George in Puerto Rico, Spain. 
1884. George's father was born in Spain, the peninsula, right? While his mother was born in Puerto Rico. And in 1905 on the census, George was a stepson of Joseph Vega and his mother Neva, um, who had remarried. Neva's birthplace is listed as Cuba. And in 1910, Mr. George Garcia is listed as a cigar factory manufacturer. And Mabel immigrated at the age of three in 1888 to the mainland. George had done so in 1901 and was naturalized. She was not a citizen. So what starts out as a story of a Cuban American cigar heiress being murdered and being embroiled in intimate partner violence really becomes a complicated narrative in terms of nationality, ethnicity, and race. Because Mabel Garcia's parents were born in Italy and might like so many other Italians who immigrated to the United States at the turn of the century, she instead is transposed into being Cuban by virtue of her marriage. Mr. Garcia, on the other hand, comes from a legacy of cigar owners because Joseph Vega, uh, was an importer of materials from his home of Cuba, Spain, right? And we know this because in uh, the uh, 1890 census, he had 21 people living in his household, including all of the siblings from a previous marriage, three half siblings, and a bunch of despiladores, which are the people that uh, peel the leaves to make cigars. So by the 1910 census, George was married to Mabel, and he was not Cuban, but he was Puerto Rican because he was born in Puerto Rico, right? But then publicly, as I mentioned, he's called a Spaniard, right? Associated with his trade as a cigar maker, and I would argue, <clears throat> rightness. Even though if you know the Leyenda Negra of Spain, the Black legend, Spaniards are not white, right? They are mixed with Moorish, North African blood, and therefore that's where we get the Black. Um, the black legend, right? And so because of this, right, I want us to think about why the children get placed in foster care and also why they represent this kind of newly enmeshed world of Latinx being, right, through multiple streams of immigration. I should note that by 1930, all of the Garcia children aged out of St. Joseph's home and Evelyn, the youngest, was 18 at the time and lived with Mabel's widowed sister in New York, New Jersey. Um, Mrs. Burnett, right, who witnessed the murder, was married to a U.S. citizen and actually lived in Peekskill, which makes me think that this is a question of economics and why they didn't take it on, take the kids on. Right, so with this information um, about muddled racial and national origins, gender violence, um, in the history of Mabel and George Garcia's family and their children, this provides a circuitous map of what constituted the Latinx world in the early 20th century. Oops. So here we see the census for 1920 when they're still in peak skill. Um, the ages, right, they're, they're inmates. That's really, I know it's standard, but it's still really disturbing to me. Okay, so, and this is the evidence of the fact that, um, that George is indeed, this is his mother, right? She's born in Cuba, um, and then she works in the home. This is his stepfather, Joseph Vega, right? And he is from, he's renting furnished rooms. So we get a sense of that context of the world that George Garcia comes from. And so George Garcia is naturalized um, when they're living on Bleecker Street in um, 1879. So we, we know that he becomes a US citizen that his sponsor is Delgado. And so here we get the um, passenger list for a steamer that was bound from New York City Harbor to Cuba for, uh, to pick up cigar supplies and industry, which shows that George Garcia, even if it's through his stepfather, has long ties to this historic uh, trade, also a circuit of revolution, if you know anything about um, Jose Marti and the independentistas in the Ten Years' War. I'm not going to go into all that. 
right? But I think that these documents tell us about the larger context of both the family and what the children do not inherit, right? So as I mentioned, Evelyn, 18 years of age, lives at 54 Sherman Avenue in New Jersey, living with her mother's sister, Rosa Ferrara, working as a department store sales lady, right? She could read and write. The father was listed as born and being in Cuba and the mother in Italy. And so this is her self-narration. Right. So we, you know, and anyone who's worked with census data, you know that like if the enumerator makes decisions about you, they make decisions about you. They call you black or mulatto or white or whatever they, whatever they've decided at the moment. Right. Um, and uh, Rosa's hus Rose's husband is actually uh, an Italian immigrant as well. Right. So this gets further complicated. So I want to, make some closing points here as I've taken you through this piece of intimate partner violence, which is that Mabel and George Garcia's family, as well as Ronaldo as an independent actor, represent the histories of diaspora and or empire in Latinx studies. Cubans migrated to New York City seeking political freedoms and business opportunities while Italians left a bleak economy in the North in the late 19th, early 20th century. George Garcia's family arrived after the 10 years war against Spain when in 1866, the Madrid government organized the Junta de Información to respond to the protesting voices of Cuban born nationalists. And even though George, there's no evidence that George Garcia was involved in these political movements, he nonetheless is a product of them. So, well, it's not clear if this family was connected to Criollo-led independence movements and networks of liberation fronts that opened, operated out of Key West and New York City cigar making circles. There is nonetheless a kindred relationship between Mabel and George Garcia in their role as immigrants, right? And so as the census goes on, the Garcia children that remain uh, are narrated as white in the census. So there's also a shift. So what this story tells us within the context of mass immigration and waves of late 19th, the late 19th and early 20th centuries, when coupled with a tenuous relationship to wealth and whiteness, whether we're talking about Ronaldo, Diego Garcia, and the five children, um, is that there is this tenuous relationship which makes this intimate partner violence, murder, suicide, an example of misplaced affections and intentions, but read publicly as sensationalism and perhaps a propensity for over emotionality amongst Latinx immigrants more broadly, right? And I put that in quotes. So as I close out my talk today, I wanna just highlight the mismatch between Ronaldo's sense of being and the materiality of the world most direct reflecting his emotional and economic state. What we never learn is the emotional and economic state of chil the children after they leave the state. We only have this evidence that Evelyn is living and working in Newark in 1930 and then the trail goes close, cold. So I think that their legacy, right, needs to be framed as one of diaspora and loss as a result of intimate partner violence. That is, that is how these children are inaugurated into the world after the death of their mother. They represent how Italian, Cuban, Puerto Rican, Spanish individuals uh, experience the economic and social relations of loss after violence and suicide. So ultimately, right, the link between this project and uh, my second book, which was on diaspora, is to always keep thinking about race, gender, and sexuality at the forefront of how I examine economics and change over time. The Garcia narrative really <coughs> encapsulates the tension and racism in Latinx studies in Afro-Latinx and indigenous communities, right? And so I operate for this project Sorry, I'm so used to pointing that way, right? With four basic points, which is one, right? Thinking about a Latinx world and world making and inauguration through violence, right? 
I pick 1880 to 1917 because it's the period of peak immigration. There are more market crashes than one can count, right? 1893 being the biggest. There's tons of economic stability and it leads up to World War I where Latinx people are disproportionately drafted into the US services compared to their relative population numbers. The other thing that I think is important, especially in the intimate partner violence case of Garcia, is that she represents not just women entering the workforce, right, but also mass migration uh, from Europe and Latin America being compounded by an economic downturn. And in some ways, Mabel Garcia's position as a cigar factory owner, while tenuous, is an anomaly, right, not the standard. And what I want to argue, leave as a kind of closing argument is that intimate partner violence ordered the world as a violent response to women's behaviors in the public and domestic spheres. And when I say women, I'm also talking about trans women. So I just want to want to be clear about that. Um, and one of the things that I'm still struggling with, and we can talk about this, is you know what does it mean to resort to violence against the object of desire? What does it mean to think about? violence as a mode of communication. So I want to just say a couple last things about the family and what I think we learned from this. Right. The intimate partner violence committed by individuals from Latinx communities across the nation. I have multiple case studies in Texas, California, Illinois, Florida, Connecticut, New York. So it's a comparative Latinx studies project, which is why this is my third book and not my second book, because it's taken a long time. Right? Perhaps explains why violence became a conflict resolution tool, a mode of communication that then is pathologized by Anglo-Americans. It also gives us a map to question and think about whiteness and blackness, instead of thinking them as Categories together, they're separated by signaling inequality, making the violence of intimate partner violence, as the news said, abhorrent, right? This was a cultural and gendered response to being a new woman and a widow, right? This is the era when you know, flappers and extravagance and women's independence kind of come to the fore, especially in places like New York City. And there was a statement of economic independence symbolically for Mabel Garcia by thwarting Ronaldo's marriage and proposals and buying him out. So in this regard, right, intimate partner violence, even though this partnership with Mrs. Garcia was imagined and economic, it was still grounded in marriage as a fantasy of existence. And the murder-suicide shows the failure to provide effective channels for more constructive communication and interaction because patriarchy trumps those structures. And so we learn how fraud, being an Italian, Cuban, Spanish, Puerto Rican cigar heiress and the child of that cigar heiress show the trauma of the murder in IPV and its impact of her children's lives in the social service sector as origin, orphans in New York City's Latinx diaspora. So in other words, the inheritance of these Latinx children is an inheritance of violence and trauma. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Nicole, for your analysis. Um, I would ask uh, we have about 15 minutes for conversation. Please identify yourself if you would um, when you speak. And I should note that I just responded to my reader reports. So this is a really good time mm. for feedback, especially if you have problems with the work, because I want to address those now. <laughs> okay. I have a million questions, but yeah, Isabel. I have a quick question also because I need to leave, but thank you so much for this talk. I wish I had uh, prepared ahead of time, I could have had you speak to my Latinx youth class about identity and the okay. shifts of it, but it was 
Fascinating. Um, I have just a quick question. You cite to, I think it's to English language newspapers. How or was this characterized in the Spanish language newspapers floating around New York City, and especially in the Cuban community? And how was it characterized or did you not? So it's, it's a one line mention, which I have footnoted. Um, and it's just woman murdered by immigrant. Like, and there's no follow up. And so that's what makes me think that they're not connected to the Cuban revolutionary circuit that controls the press, right? And one of the longest stories comes from the Brooklyn Eagle, which has a Spanish language cognate and it's a one-liner. So that's why you're not seeing it here is because the meat of the evidence comes from the English language world, which is why I mentioned yellow journalism because at some level, we have to think about how the desire to sell papers is wound up in the way that this narrative is being told. And so I'm still looking, I'm still chugging away, trying to find other, other evidence. I mean, I, I need to go to the Schomburg for sure. Like I haven't done that yet. Um, and I'm also wondering if, if the Italian American press covered it. I haven't done that either. So. To answer your question, it's minimally mentioned as there were these columns in a lot of newspapers in the late 19th, early 20th century where they would just like enumerate all the crimes that happened in the last week. And that's the context. But you're making me think that I need to talk about that in and of itself because it's just another violent event. But yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, KJ Rothman, I have a kind of a follow on question to that. And, and that's really about like how hard it is to find this family's story from their perspective that isn't rendered not only yeah. through the violence that they experienced, but also through mechanisms of the state and journalism, right? And um, narratives to which the communities that they belong did not have control. So I'm just wondering like how to reconcile that, especially from say like a feminist methods perspective or um, you know, like a, a critical race studies perspective. Like there are so many different angles um, to think about that incommensurability with, sure. this, with the voice and the narratives that are unavailable. I'm just kind of curious how you're. Yeah. So that question actually was asked um, by one of the readers of my manuscript, um, and you know it was how do you how do you um, basically forefront the positionality of the individuals in a way that would not put words in them, right? Um, and so. One of the ways that I try and recognize, reconcile that dissonance or tension is with the intimate partner violence framework, right? And so maybe I need to mark that more as a feminist method um, because before I was just, I was thinking about this project as one about murder suicide, but that's not it because of the gendered racial dimensions that, that run throughout the entire, the entire book. Um, and so that's one way I do it. I'm still working on it. You know, this is a hard question. It's not easy. And I'm not interested in resistance. I'm not interested in agency, right? I'm trying to work with what I have. And it's really hard. I mean, you work in trans history, you know. It's really hard to trace uh, the lives of people when they're not writing them themselves, as you mentioned. And so what I've also done is tried to look at fictionalized accounts in Spanish language newspapers about murder, about suicide, about domestic violence, about women's behavior to try and scaffold the context, right? So this is stripped down for the talk, so I don't take forever. <laughs> Right, but what's fascinating about this moment is that people from Latinx people from California, Mexican origin, Peruvian, Chilean origin, right, the residuals of the mining industry with the the, the Chileans and the Peruvians, Mexicans being large population, Cubans and Puerto Ricans in New York, they're writing about suicide. They're writing about domestic violence in on. Un, um, unattributable authorial 
editorial fashion, right? So it's like, people are clearly thinking about this. It's a concern they're trying to figure out. And then you'll have a common, a, a columns that says suicidio, right? Suicide. And it'll be next to la mujer moderna, right? And then there will be another story about la casa domestica, right? And so it's, I'm trying to scaffold the social world, which is why I use Latinx world as another way to do this, right? What does it mean for suicide to be discussed with the modern woman and with the domestic sphere? That's a mess, but it's what the people are thinking about. And so it's not, it's not an answer. It's not satisfying, but it's what I have. How do you handle it? No, thank you. That was, <laughs> that was a brilliant response. And I think the others in the room actually might want to speak to this mm -hmm. question. <laughs> I don't know about speak to, um, but I have a related question. Um, and I, I actually thought about when you started talking the, the, in the clip that you showed from the newspaper, immediately thought of Coco Fusco's piece on the dead Latina woman. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I wonder if that might be a possibility in terms of thinking about where um, might want to, um, they, they might, there might be something useful. Um, sure. Um, but was super fascinated by the racial valences of this um, because, right, West Indian is traditionally understood as somebody who's connected to the Anglophone um, West Indies, right? Not very rarely um, attached to um, the other um, folks. So I'm thinking, you know, I wonder what's going on with that. Like why, right, immediately going to West Indian, you know, clearly the last name is not um, mm -hmm. Anglophone. Um, and then Cuba, right, and Puerto Rico and all these other places that are mentioned. So why um, is the focus on um, on racial? Uh, and I'm wondering what else might be going on in terms of race, in terms of um, uh, immigration uh, directly from the uh, Anglophone Caribbean, um, right? This is the beginnings or, or right before, right? Um, Marcus Garvey's movement, mm -hmm. um, right, um, in Harlem. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, maybe, you know, there might be, obviously, right, there's fear um, around that. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, yeah, it mm -hmm. raises so many really cool and interesting, you know, not cool, but questions about how this is being narrated and then the effect of the, um, on, the on the children. Um, but just to, to briefly engage with, um, uh, KJ's question about like how do you narrate the story when all you you have right are these mediated um, sources and I think it is really useful I think for you to frame it around this question of the U.S. Latinx world um, and almost when you were talking about the actual newspaper um, and the messiness of the newspaper that felt like somewhere um, that there might be um, some kind of purchase um, to talk about um, just the, yeah, the, the, the mediation of these voices. Uh, yeah, there's just so much. I don't even know where to go next, so. Well, you know, this is, you, you, you've actually given me some place to go, which is, you know, that's what revisions are, right? Is what's, where are you going next? And so I think you're right. Like, I need to figure out where Anglophone Caribbean people are living in New York City. And if it's anywhere near here, maybe Ronaldo was West Indian. They do call him Reynolds, but I'm so used to people slaughtering Latinx surnames and first names in the census. Like people wrote what they heard phonetically. So it makes me believe he is Ronaldo and that he is Afro-Cuban. He's also referred to as a dark West Indian, right? So I'm also wondering if those are the only, like the, there is an impossibility of imagining Cubanness as black, right? Mm -hmm. Which is where I allude to that, but I, I think I need to talk about it more directly as an impossibility. Let me just take a note to myself. No, there are, would that be recorded? I even wonder. Right? I mean, it might be, it might be. The other thing I want to do is look at, see if the, this, the, the home has archives. And maybe try and find some of the descendants. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nicole, we have we are at three minutes of the hour, and I know of at least two hands there exactly. and my own. So I'm wondering if you just want to collect, even yes. if you don't have time to yes. answer yes. some and, of these responses. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Hi, my name is Des. I am the admin assistant for Poli Sci. Um, I just wanted to ask a quick question about the term um, inter intimate partner violence, because mm -hmm. uh, you also mentioned that previously with murder suicide. 
for domestic violence only because the relationship is like delusional mm -hmm. um, based on the man's end. Like, would there be another term that you would use to describe that better? Or do you feel like that was? Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you for that. Um, Elizabeth? Really, I had the same question, which is what what's the intimate partner violence and stalker suggest a kind of two different things going on. Um, and uh, so I just wondered, yeah, I was really interested in hearing um, more about the intimate partner violence framework, which seems like you've mentioned a few times that it's um, important to you. And I just wanted to hear more about why, yeah, how that importance is working. And, and, I, and I guess I was interested in, um, I, I have to confess, I'm in the middle of teaching Gail Rubin's traffic, traffic and Rubin right now. So I'm thinking about like, the, like if, 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 Re, if Ronaldo is, is claiming the right to intimacy, right? So he has a, he has a claim that he's imagining that his, his masculinity gives him a, a kind of right of possession and his masculinity. So he's imagining some form of, of intimacy that he has a right to. And she, on the other hand, is imagining that he does not have the right to that intimacy. So, uh, so, and this may be wrong, but I'm sort of imagining his authority is grounded in masculinity and her authority is grounded in, uh, in race, in colorism. Um, or not, or just or not. crazy. Yeah. That's what yeah. I wanted to say. Yeah. You know, her rejection is overdetermined in that he's clearly inappropriate in a hundred ways. And I wondered about the, I mean, he murdered her. So that she rejected him does not make, and stalked her, um, does not, and you make the argument that there's an anti-black subtext. And I'm thinking that's possible, but not inevitable that she may simply have autonomy and agency and wealth and, you know, for lots of reasons does not want this man. So I, I worry about, assigning that motive to her because mm -hmm. I think there, you know, that it's a possibility, but it's not inevitable. It also, there are two more people who want to speak. So I, I'm missing very much some of the details of the domestic narrative, but I'm a narrative nerd. Um, yeah. That is what happened to the factory? Um, and did the state appropriate it because it appropriated the children? And if not, it would have provided the wealth necessary to the sisters if the children were the natural heirs to the to the business that to um, be their uh, to be their um, guardians. So we need to know if the sisters had the opportunity to um, adopt the children or at least assume guardianship and rejected that opportunity, or if they were never given that opportunity, and the fate of the wealth that they would have been natural heirs to, because that seems to be a really big part of the, of the story. Um, and I also struggled with, I understand why you wanna make this, make the case about intimate partner violence because of how it fits into your theoretical framework. But I also think it's very important to distinguish this from intimate partner violence insofar as his, um, his uh, authority is delusional, whereas the authority of a husband under legal frameworks of that moment would not have been delusional. And the issue of shame, that's a, a feature of intimate partner violence for women would not have been a burden for her because she didn't choose this man. Yeah. Um, so um, just so I went off you that I only want to give you um, a chance. I have to a talk. quick question. I was hoping that you could talk a little more, more about violence being a mode of communication and in intimate partner violence. I ask because I think that communication, unless I see the prefix miss, I think it of its positive connotation. And since nice. it results, since their this intimate partner relationship, the Lulu as it is, results in death. I wonder how, like, how does communication fit in as a model? Um, how does intimate property uh, IPV fit in as a model for communication? Like the violence there, I don't, I don't see that as like communicate. I don't know. It's not certainly not good communication. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Erica. Okay. Uh, last question, I guess. Um, as the Shakespearean in the room, I couldn't help but notice the Romeo and Julieta um, reference. And 
the way that he's attempting to seize the narrative, um, which is a narrative about a double suicide of lovers. Um, and I'm curious if you've if you've read um, if you're reading it through the literary inheritance that he's trying to take control over reading his per perhaps reading his own delusional love story through um, and that play itself has its own contested history vis-a-vis uh, -vis a white Anglophone culture um, with uh, Italians, the Italians, um, yeah. right, where she's Italian, um, where there's a, a, a racial dimension um, about Juliet's whiteness, um, her contested whiteness um, as an Italian. Oh, Italian, that's a good point. There is yet another comment in the room, two more. So I, here's what I'm gonna do since it's my job to police the clock um, is to honor the fact that we are over time, but also allow people if they want to stay and can stay and if Nicole is um, able to maybe give responses, hear other comments to let that happen. But I will formally close us out and indicate that there is more food and one should please help yourself to more lunch. Um, it, I also don't have in front of me when the next faculty work in progress is, but it's really important that people come in and it's always so interesting and valuable. Please be on the lookout for those announcements. Encourage your colleagues to come and come yourself. And um, I'm most, most importantly, I don't want to end today's session without expressing gratitude to Tanya Mungia, who has left, I think, but um, and to Abhishek Sands, both of whom have been holding up the planet at the Humanities Center over the course of really two months of um, needing the planet to be held up and things swept up and I have I've lots of metaphors for um, the kinds of uh, heroic work that both have been doing to make today possible and to make everything else possible. And I personally am very grateful. Thank you both. Um, with that, um, feel free to move and also we will continue. <laughs> Yeah.